This morning we're going to read from Psalm 100. It's a very uh, brief psalm. It's probably known better than any other psalm except for Psalm 23. And there is this just jam packed full of stuff. Got a little ring in Aaron. Good stuff, which we're just going to just kind of just look at just a couple things prior to having the Lord's Supper. Hopefully, that will encourage you in your life. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing, and know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Just a great psalm. And there are several imperatives that God gives us in this psalm. And you know that an imperative is where God commands us to do something. It's not optional. It's not a suggestion. And so um, it'll be interesting for us to just kind of just glance at this for a minute or two. Uh, thank you for all your prayers uh, for uh, the Hodo family and my family, and then also Grace and her family as her mom went on to be with the Lord already. And we're waiting on Doug's departure. And, uh, it, you know, it's never easy. Um, as a preacher, I guess, doing this 26 years, you deal with death a lot more so, much more so than the average person. Usually the average person deals with it in a special way when it's in their own immediate family. But when you're a preacher, you're involved in everybody's immediate family. And so it just goes on. Death is a part of life. Uh, this earth is cursed, and uh, barring the rapture, each one of us are going to die. And that's why it's so important for a person to come to know the Lord and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and Grace's mom did, and so does Doug. And so I get, in one sense, I get excited about Christians, about believers, about sons and daughters of the Lord who are going to go home, because the time comes for each of us when God says, I got work for you to do in another place, and it's in my house. And it's time for you to come home. But we let God, we allow the Lord to make those decisions in our lives. He knows what's best, and so we trust Him. Well, this uh, kind of thought runs through Psalm 100, this idea of trusting God. And this trust that we have uh, can be expressed uh, through certain ways. Psalm 100 gives us some indication of how this trust, this faith that we say we have in God can be expressed in our lives. So I want you to notice here in verse 1, right off the bat, it says, make a joyful shout. Now before we get to shout, I want to look at joyful. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. God is commanding you to be joyful. Now, that's an interesting subject. Now think about this for a minute. How can God command you to be joyful? Now, do any of you directly control your emotions? You don't. You do not. You cannot turn off and turn on your emotions like you can with a switch. God did not make you that way. So why would God command you to do something that you can't do? Because this joy 
that he is commanding you to experience has nothing to do with feelings. This this joy comes via a choice. A choice that you make as you express your faith to God regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the events, regardless of whether your agenda is following suit or not. This choice is all about who he is. The fact that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is sovereign. He does have all authority. He does orchestrate every aspect of your life, and you are acknowledging that with a choice. And when you do so, joy will be your experience. Let me give you an example. I asked Allison, because I don't get Instagram. I don't know how you do that. So I asked Allison to forward me the Instagram that Luke posted uh, just a couple days ago. We just flew him in from Hawaii, so he's there with the boys as they're helping Doug, as he's struggling for every breath that he's taking uh, on this side of heaven. But some of you already know, uh, but for those of you who don't, that he had to take a medical retirement from football. So his plans were thwarted. He had to do so because of his knees. Uh, uh, his uh, kneecaps they were just susceptible to dislocating. And he knew that it was just time that if he went on, he could really damage his knees. And to be honest with you, that decision about his kneecaps was about nine months in the womb. He was born that way. God knew it all along. We didn't. Luke didn't know it. And so he went in to see the head coach, and he told him, and great news is with the NCAAs, they just continue to pay for your school and everything until you graduate. So, so we don't feel too sorry for him over there in Hawaii. <laughs> but nevertheless, his dream was to get on the field and, 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 you know, at least play a little bit. That never happened. So how would Luke respond to that? I didn't, you know, I didn't say anything other than we just love him and encourage him and all that. But here's what he wrote. I think this illustrates what God is talking about in Psalm 100 and verse 1 about this experience of joy. Luke writes, I'm sorry to announce that my career in football has come to an end. Unfortunately, I've been through too many knee injuries where I need to consider my future outside of football. Thank you to everyone who has supported me from Floresville, Blinn College, and the University of Hawaii. My goal, here's his agenda, ever since I was a kid was to play Division I football and earn an athletic scholarship. I can honestly say that I've done everything in my power to make that dream come true. But God closes a door and then opens a new one. I will forever be content knowing that, listen, my identity is not in being a football player. My identity is in Christ. Uh, He goes on to say, um, this is not where I wanted my football career to end, but God is in control, and I trust in His plan. Thank you all again for all you have supported me throughout my career. Now a new chapter in my life begins. Now that is what God is talking about in Psalm 100. That experience of joy had nothing to do with a feeling. It had everything to do with making a choice. By the way, in case you're wondering, I I did the airplane thing so nobody could call me, you know, where you put the fuel on there. (laughs) So I'm safe. So we want to make little choices every single day where we recognize who God is and his authority over our lives and that he orchestrates our lives. If we don't make little choices as things, those little bitty things deviate in our lives and don't go our way, then we'll be ready for the big things that come. Don't wait on the big things to practice on this. Start now with those little 
bitty deviations in your life, those little goal breakers, those little irritations, make a choice. Father, I choose to put my trust in you. You're guiding my life. Whatever you want to bring to me, I welcome it. All day long, we want to be making that confession. Now, he says, we are to make a joyful shout to the Lord. We can express this joy through a shout. Well, what's he talking about there? Well, I think God wants us to shout every once in a while. Amen? Amen. Well, let's practice, okay? On the count of three, loud as you can, let's say praise the Lord, okay? You ready? One, two, are you ready? Okay, just checking. One, two, three, praise the Lord. All right, hey man, we're following the command of God. Now, that's one way we can shout. I want to illustrate another way. <clears throat> you know, Daniel, Akbar, is living with us in this fall here to finish law school. Daniel's from Iran, got saved, and his wife left. You know that story. And Daniel, uh, his partner in crime over in College Station, sent me a book called Secret Believers. And I've been reading this book. And I don't hardly read anything extracurricular, extracurricular out of school, but I just couldn't resist on this one. And I read this little story. What this book is about is the real experience of several people who have grown up in a Muslim country and have grown up Muslim, and their experience in coming to Christ. Now, they change the names, and they don't tell you the real country that they're from, but there's one guy that they have named here, Ahmed. Ahmed has gone to the mosque. He's on his knees. He's doing the normal ritual thing that Muslims do after hearing the call to prayer. This is the mid-afternoon call to prayer. And I want to read to you a little bit of what he says. He just got through hearing once again like he has a thousand times before. Praise be to God, the Lord of the universe, the compassionate, the merciful, sovereign of the day of judgment. You alone we worship. Guide us to the straight path. And he's speaking about Allah. How many times, he says, has he recited those words? Thousands. Did he believe them? Of course. And yet, this is all going in his brain. He was changing. Whom did God favor? Over the past year, he had read and reread the Bible and teachings of Jesus. The prophet called Esau in the Quran still astonished him. He memorized several of the prophet's statements. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. Yet the Quran, by contrast, commanded him to fight and kill. I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, Jesus said, has already committed adultery within his heart. But the Koran permitted him to have four women and to keep all women captured in any invaded land. He knew the arguments against the Bible, that it was distorted and required the corrective of the Koran. But the man, Jesus, he attracted Ahmed like a butterfly drawn to a colorful flower. Ahmed bowed, his hands on his knees, his back straight, as the imam recited a short surah. With the assembly, he raised his head and responded, God hears those who praise him. God is most great, speaking about Allah. But in his mind, how great was the prophet Jesus, Ahmed thought. You were rich in being and poor in things. How could you give when you had not even a place to lay your head? You gave us your heart, that vast expanse that still encompasses us, weary and heavy laden. Many have wealth, he's thinking, salt water that will not quench their thirst. You can see them in their towers, hungry. They are there in the air-conditioned castles, famished. The metal cash boxes do not satisfy, they only rust. Standing again as the prayers continued, 
Ahmed thought about his meditation on Jesus. Yes, something has happened to him. When had the change occurred? Perhaps he would never discern the exact moment, but he knew now that he was convinced. It was impossible to live without Jesus Christ because only Jesus gave real meaning to life because Jesus Christ was in fact divine. He's having these thoughts while he's in the mosque. What was a Muslim to do with such a conclusion? To see God in any being was shirk, in any human being was shirk, the worst sin of an Islam, Islam, because God could never be in a man. As the prayers ended, Ahmad turned to his neighbor and said, peace be unto you. And notice that that young man was already developing a dark spot in the center of his forehead from repeatedly bowing and forcefully touching his head to the lower floor, a mark of pride for a devout Muslim. They sat down on the floor as the imam placed the Koran on the, the table and on that wooden, wooden stand. In his youthful endurance, in his thirst for truth, Ahmed felt compelled to speak. Maybe others in the room had similar thoughts, but only lacked the boldness to voice their doubts. He would raise the right question, the honest question, politely addressing the imam, he asked, why do we, the religion that honors the prophets, ignore the greatest prophet of all? The iman looked at him stunned that anyone would speak before he had started his lesson, and Ahmed couldn't stop now. Is there anyone greater than the prophet Isa? I look at him, and I see perfection. Listen, I look at him, and I see God. And that's when all hell broke out. On Ahmed. He didn't scream at the top of his lungs. You see, all it takes sometimes is just a soft whisper to shout about the Lord and his goodness and his faithfulness. You and I live in a world of darkness. We live around people that don't know the Lord and are confused, and sometimes they even speak against the Lord, and they speak about what God is doing. What does Psalm 100 command us to do? To make a joyful shout. Not to be quiet, but to speak for the Lord. Psalm 100, God is saying to us, this is what I command you to do. This is what you should do. And then, and we're about out of time, he says, serve the Lord with gladness. Let me close. <clears throat> when we speak about serving the Lord, this is all the time we have. And I read... This, uh, this little article about a search committee that was calling a pastor their, to their church, and so they were interviewing their pastor who was going to be their shepherd, under-shepherd. He walks in the room, and he sits down, and he begins talking. And he says, I want to be clear about a few things. I'm going to give you a well-prepared, excellently delivered sermon on a consistent basis. That's my responsibility. But I also want you to be clear, I don't want too much to be expected of me. I have a hard time when I have too much to do, and I don't really like getting my hands too dirty in messy issues. I want to leave, those to, leave that to other people. By the way, I'm a person who does not like conflict. So what I want to do is come in and preach the sermon that I have the responsibility to give you, and then I want to just see how things shake out. I'll be a nice guy. I will slap backs. I will shake hands. I will eat apple pies with the ladies who fix them at the church. But I really don't want to be involved in confronting anyone. 
The other thing you need to know about me is my personality type. I've taken a personality inventory, and I don't like making decisions. So I'm going to leave all that stuff to the other people. And if it ever gets really hard around here, what I'm going to do is bail out and find somewhere else to preach. Because after all, I've got to look after me. Wow. Well, you know, that little commentary is not just about preachers. It's about every single one of us, isn't it? Here's what God is commanding us to do. To make a joyful shout to the Lord and to do it serving Him, not grudgingly, not always looking for the exit door when things get difficult or even people become difficult. But no, staying in the fight, staying in the foxhole that God puts you in without any notation of retreat to serve Him with gladness, not with complaint, but with what? The rest of the psalm tells us. We enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Finally, God says, come. Come into my presence. That's the invitation today for the Lord's Supper. Come with joy. Come with a shout. Come with gladness serving the Lord, with thanksgiving and with praise. For God is always good, He's always merciful, and He's always faithful. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. as we're praying about our own lives and asking the Lord if there's anything that He wants to touch inside of our lives that we need to address, that we need to get right, maybe we need to confess. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me just give you a few minutes to have time with the Lord this morning on a personal level. Thank mm-hmm. you.